and check, 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 miggity mic check. And we are rolling with another episode of Industry Interviews. I am your host and good buddy, Dan Brown Jr., creative director and composer of the Emmy-nominated Crime Sonics. And today I am joined by the director of A&R at Art of Artist Max, Nittany Paris. How are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me here today, Dan. Oh, I can't wait. I, you know what? So like a true cyber hacker, I have been online looking at your websites, doing some Facebook stalking, doing my research, and I have got some really interesting questions I want to ask about your background. You grew up in Pennsylvania, yeah? Yes, I did. Let's I talk did. about that because I am also from the Midwest, but is that considered the Midwest or is that considered like the Mideast? Well, we consider it East Coast, but it's not really coastal, but closer, it's only three hours from New York. Yeah. Um, so we kind of, I mean, we always identified more, and I was on the Eastern part of Pennsylvania too, so it's, about an hour from Philadelphia. Regardless, it's a world away from life in Los Angeles, yeah? Yes, for sure. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about, um, well, here, I won't be so vague. So I, I'm going to get into everything you're doing now and your business and your career <laughs> and your tons of awards and songs and credits and all the amazing stuff that you do. But honestly, I do these podcasts because I think it's much more fun to humanize people and just learn who people are and just hear stories, you know? Oh, I love that. Yeah. And so I'm really just interested in hearing about your time in Pennsylvania, early musical uh, experiences, specifically the church. The reason why I'm asking this is because I also grew up in a town that's similar to some of the things that you've articulated in your bio, and there was a church right across the street. So fill, fill us in a little bit about growing up in Pennsylvania. Okay, sure. Um, well, I lived in a, many different places in Pennsylvania. Um, mm. the, the story that you're referring to um, was from a time when I lived in a city in a city called Reading, Pennsylvania, yeah. which you might have heard of. It's the same Reading as the Reading Railroad in Monopoly. Um, and, uh, but anyway, it's um, the city now, I, I understand a few years ago, it was named the poorest city in the nation. Hmm. And uh, I know it's changed a lot over the years, but even back then when I lived in the city, there was, um, it was very multicultural. There were a lot of people living together in small neighborhoods with row homes and, uh, and I lived in one of those one of those neighborhoods, and I had a uh, right across the street from my house. I had a, a Puerto Rican church, and then right behind me, literally in my backyard, there was a, one of the oldest African American churches um, that was also part of the Underground Railroad. Yeah. So um, I had those influences, and I would I remember going to sleep at night with the window open and hearing music coming from both churches. And um, of course, in that, at that time in our neighborhood, we couldn't participate in any of that. Um, but I did get to enjoy the music, and I think that definitely had an influence on me. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so originally, I always tell people I'm from St. Louis, because ah. no one would ever know the town I'm actually from. I'm actually from a small town called Alton, which is on the Illinois side of the Mississippi River. Oh. And it is also a town that was very instrumental in the Underground Railroad. And similar to your story, it was also, and I think still is, a really segregated town. Yeah. But there are these older African-American churches that have so much incredible uh, history, heritage, and then the music that comes out of them windows. Mm -hmm. We had one directly across the street from our house. Isn't that cool? So I totally... Uh -huh. Yep. Great, we have that in common. Yeah, I, to I totally, I totally. When I was reading your bio, I thought, "Whoa, that is crazy!" I never thought someone living, you know, in LA has that same very similar story. So, how did you? So, you said it had an impact on you. Like, talk to me about that. When you were laying in bed listening to this music, were you singing along? I mean, did you already always know that you wanted to work in music? Uh, no, I didn't always know I wanted to work in music. I did have a lot of music influence around me. My dad played guitar and sang, oh. um, but he also worked a lot and really didn't have time to teach me. And I really wanted to learn to play the guitar and uh, lessons just weren't really in the cards for me and my brothers and sisters. So, so I really grew up without music, aside from listening to music that I loved. Um, of course, I mean, I, I always had, uh, music blaring in my room as a teenager, but I didn't have um, any real lessons when I was a child. So I did hear that music in the neighborhood and I learned a lot about um, tolerance by living in a neighborhood like that and yeah. acceptance. And at that time there was still 
and I'm sure there still is now, uh, but there was a lot of a lot of racism and segregation. And um, so I learned so much from that and it really shaped who I am today. That's something that I feel very passionate about. And even, you know, I went on to study race relations and women's studies and things, you know, to deal with racism and sexism and those kind of things. Did you also go to school for music? I did not. <laughs> well, let me say, I didn't start off with that. I did take some classes. Yeah, it's yeah, it's interesting. I I, I didn't either in uh, my younger life. Later, I went to college and got a bachelor's in music. But uh, yeah, yeah. I, it's interesting because you know there's two, especially in Los Angeles, there's two trains of thought, right? Some some people think you have to have that structured academia side of music, and then there's the whole rock star side too, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so help me understand how you go from. Pennsylvania to Los Angeles. Talk to me about that. Uh, well, I was, I was studying psychology while working full time when I lived in Pennsylvania. Yeah. And, um, and I wasn't sure if I even wanted to go into psychology, but I was really fascinated with the way the human mind works. And, um, and uh, I decided that I wanted to go to UCLA. And yeah change from psychology to anthropology and focus on sociocultural anthropology. So that's what I did. I, I got a job offer from Delta Airlines and I, I drove across country with a girlfriend. It took us five days and the day I arrived, I started a new job. I left my old job, I started a new job at Delta Airlines. And, uh, and then shortly after that, I was accepted into UCLA. What were you doing with Delta? I'm just curious. Well, I was there for nine years, and I was an international sales supervisor and human resources supervisor doing communications and, and different kinds of HR things. And during that time, were you also writing music? I was not writing music. I did, when I was a teenager, when I was a little girl, I wrote some songs and I wrote some, a lot of poetry. Um, during the years when I was at, at Delta, I didn't do, I didn't write any music. I was also a full-time student at UCLA while I was in a management role at Delta Airlines. So it was crazy schedule. I would work, um, I would go to school from eight to three and then work from 3.30 till midnight. So there was absolutely no time for music. And what's kind of strange is I never thought of myself as a creative person at all. Really? And uh, never even thought that I, even though I'd been writing poetry and some of my friends even made them into songs, I never saw myself as a songwriter at all until much later. It's it's almost comical to hear you say that because on, <laughs> on your website, it looks like you've won virtually every song <laughs> competition on earth. <laughs> uh, well. So, so <laughs> help me understand from Delta school, crazy schedule to winning everything you could possibly win in songwriting. So fill in the whole story here. Okay, so I, after I worked at Delta Airlines, I, I ended up um, shortly after that I had well, I had my, my two children, but then I started working for Bank of America and I was doing change management and communications in this finance technology division. Yeah. Um, so it gave me the opportunity to do a lot of writing and communications work, but it was not in an area that I was particularly interested in. And I would go into my, my boss's office, who's actually one of my best friends now, and I would say, you gotta hear this, this new song I just wrote. <laughs> yeah. So instead of doing my work, I was doing that. And, Eventually, I, um, I was being interviewed for a new position in the company, and I ended up deciding that I took a weekend off. I met with many friends, and one of my friends said to me, I don't know why you're in the business world anyway. I've always seen you as being so creative, and it just kind of hit me in that one moment that she was right, and I just never paid any attention to that because I always had this need to just work, 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 and then I... Um, I left. I decided not to take the, or to withdraw myself from the, the running for the position I was interviewing for. And I left and I started taking classes at UCLA Extension in the independent music production program. What were those classes like? Uh, they were great. I did um, every songwriting class they offered and uh, at least once. And some of them I did even more than once. Um, the first one I took was with Marty Panzer the lyricist who wrote Through the Years with Steve Dorff and um, even now the Barry Manilow song. You probably know that one. But uh, anyway, so I had the pleasure of getting to learn from him in his class, um, writing lyrics that succeed and endure. And then through that, I, in that class, I won a scholarship, the Hal Gappa Scholarship 
to yeah. continue studying with him. So I got to study with him for, for several years after that. So when, when the class has ended, how do you bridge the gap from, okay, now I'm a grad, now I got some certificates, I'm quote unquote, a songwriter on paper. Like, how do you go from that, which I think many people find themselves out of school, right? How do you go from that to all of these credits and awards? What's next? What's the first gig? What's the first opportunity? Well, what I did, because I knew that I had a lot of catching up to do. So I was coming into this a little older than a lot of the writers that I work with now. A lot older, I should say. And I wanted to be able to catch up and really get up to speed. I had to learn not only how to write a song, but how to record a song and how to pitch a song and um, so many things. So I decided to just take every class I could, uh, take, yeah. go to workshops, go to every conference, um, really build the community, the network. And uh, I learned from people like Steve Seskin and Pat Pattison and Jason Bloom, Mary Gaucher, in addition to the classes that I took at UCLA and uh, really wanted to, and then I started going to conferences and that's when everything really changed because that's when I made the connections with people that were already in the industry and very successful and uh, formed friendships and partnerships and, and, uh, and then all my, part of my strategy also was to build my reputation so I could attract people to work with me um, and that was to enter these competitions. And I did enter a lot of competitions in those days. I, in the beginning, I really wanted to kind of build my reputation. I'm curious on how you find songwriters and how you, I don't want to say vet or validate, I'm, but I'm curious about that process. Like, do, are you actively seeking out individuals to write with? Or are they seeking out you? Paint that picture for me. Uh, both. Um, I have a, a pool of regular collaborators that I work with all the time. Yeah. Um, for my own, you know, my own music business. And I have um, a lot of artists that I'll find through different showcases or workshops or conferences I'll, I'll hear them perform or they'll reach out to me and ask and sometimes um, most recently I've had different managers will call me and ask me to write songs with their artists and um, so I've been doing a lot of that um, but on the other side of it is through artist max I do have a lot of artists that I I am introduced to there in the studio in our studio in Westlake Village because um, we we work in the studio with Michael Blue and his team yeah. So I meet a lot of people there. And then, of course, all of the Artist Max artists. And those artists reach out to us because they're aware of Ken's reputation. My, my business partner, Ken Calais, is yeah. well known. And so artists reach out to him every day. And so we have artists coming in that way as well. But, you know, it's funny because uh, I've lived in Westlake Village, Gora Hills, we're out in Thousand Oaks. Now you, your studio, your neighbors, we're neighbors. We don't even know them. <laughs> you guys are not, great. Not far, yeah, not far at all. It's, it's, it's interesting how many cool people are out this way you know yes. uh, for anyone that's listening i who are you know if you're not from the los angeles area you don't have to be directly in the city to be around really cool people right They're, we're all spread out in the hills as well you know yes it's true so i'm i'm curious about if we could flash forward i'm curious about some stuff that you've recently done 2019 winner two global peace song awards for two different songs Keep the light on in Sanctuary. What, what were those for? What's that project for? Tell me, tell me all about this. Uh, okay, so the, um, the Peace Song Award, formerly the Global Peace Song Awards, is um, it's a group of people led by Steve Robertson who uh, really believe that we can change the world with peace. I know it sounds lofty and poetic, but they really believe that we, um, as musicians and artists, we have the power to change the world. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, just in terms of the, the positive messages that we share, and, and um, I know Steve even believes that on a vibrational level, that there's a positive influence in music. So, but for me, I got involved because um, I met Steve and he heard one of my songs and encouraged me to submit it to that competition. And, um, and I did a few years ago and um, I had one of my songs was a finalist. And then, um, and then last year, as, as you said, I uh, won two awards for in the rock and pop category for two songs that I had written, one of which I wrote at a retreat that I hosted at a castle in France. And it was the first song we wrote that day. Um, and it was called Keep the Light On. And it was about being there for others in times of darkness. And um, so that was the, the song that, um, that won the that's, a, that's an interesting um, 
you hinted at that and I have to ask. So you hosted a retreat in a castle in France. Yes. <laughs> that, that sounds dope. <laughs> Tell me about this. What, what is this retreat? How do I come to the next one? Uh, well, the retreat was held at the uh, Chateau de La Salle in Macomb, France. Yeah. And um, I've been thinking about doing a retreat in France for a long time. And then one of my colleagues, Ian Carter, um, met with me and said that he had found this place and he was planning to go ahead with a retreat. And we decided to partner together on bringing people in and um, bringing in some guest speakers. And so we hosted it together. And uh, it was very small. Um, we had, I think, about 17 or 18 people. And um, uh, it was in this fab fabulous little village. Um, we would have croissants delivered from the bakery every morning. And anyway, it was just fabulous. But we uh, did write, I led some writing exercises there. I brought in my friend, Alan Roy Scott, as one of our guest mentors. And um, we did some different kinds of exercises to open up creativity, like a meditation and um, some things like that, and writing exercises. And uh, we had some really good songs that came out of that that week. And now, as far as the future, I'm actually currently planning my next retreat, and it's going to be here in Malibu at a at a big mansion overlooking the ocean. So that's the next one coming up. But I will be doing another one in France soon. The the Malibu is very close. <laughs> that yeah. one. You could uh, just walk over. Yeah, I just walk over. I am all <laughs> I'm all ears. And you said the first song you wrote at that retreat was "Keep the Light On." Yes. Yes. That's, that's amazing. So, and how did that, the, the, how do I articulate the question? Is it one of those songs or one of those experiences where it just comes out of nowhere? Paint the picture for me a little. Well, actually, no, it's kind of interesting the way this happened. Um, I was there with, with my husband, um, Jean-Pierre Williams, my, yep. my, and my friends, Patricia Bahia and Betty Lawrence, um, who Betty and Patricia make up a, a duo called Seventh and Hope. And we were there before everyone else, or we were maybe the second ones there. So we went outside on a, a stone table right next to the main building. And we just started writing and we were thinking of ideas, having that brainstorming session about what to write about. And um, I forget who suggested it, but we decided to do some, to start with some object writing, hmm. which um, you probably are familiar with. But it's one of the tools that Pat Patterson uses a lot in um, writing and inspiring creativity. It's where you, you look at an object, and in our case, it was a lamp. It was a little lamp, um, like a hurricane lamp that was sitting on the table. And we decided to write about that lamp. And through that beginning, the conversation led us to this idea of being a light in the darkness for somebody. Mm. And so it's kind of an interesting way that happened. And um, started started a lot with, um, most of the song was based around some music that Pierre was playing on his guitar. And then um, Betty being the singer um, came in with some amazing melodies. And, uh, and of course we had Patricia there who's also a great writer and it turned out to be a great song. Are you a performer as well? No, no, I don't perform. I shouldn't say, I did perform my, one of my original songs in Nashville uh, a couple years ago at the Tin Pan South Festival, and that was the first and last time. Um, <laughs> well, what happens? It sounds <laughs> well, like it was a disaster. Actually, it wasn't. It was one of those things where I don't, I don't perform. I, I get on stage to introduce other people and, yeah. um, and all the time, and I'm okay with that, but I really don't like being on stage. And hmm. so I won this award, and the, the, the deal was if you won, you had to agree to sing it yourself. Mm -hmm which everybody in Nashville is okay with, but I was there and, um, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll just put my song in and see what happens. And I won, and so I had to get up on stage at the festival in front of, I think maybe like 240 people were in the room. Yeah. And, um, but the good thing was, it was the best case scenario because I had friends with me on either side um, and that were supporting me the whole day. And I had a friend who coincidentally was there in Nashville, whom I met in, in Canada a year before, and was there when the song was inspired. So she was a vocal coach and guitar player. So she, she agreed to accompany me and also coach me during the day. So I got through it and it went very well, but I, I sort of decided then that I really am not cut out for performing on stage, so. I'm sure, I'm sure it was a standing ovation. <laughs> I, I think about, um, so you come to music differently, not to personalize it, but from, I come from a live performance background and then to make the switch into studio life, it's, I miss it actually. I really miss that 
that, that tactile experience with the stage, that interaction with the audience, that immediate gratification of, um, you know, like properly emoting a musical intention and then seeing the reaction from a live audience. Oh man, I so miss that. Mm. And you're acting like, I don't ever want to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to say, though, I do get that because I, I have the pleasure of hearing artists that I work with performing my songs. And there's nothing better than that to hear uh, the audience um, respond to a song that I've written. And, um, and I get to hear that. Like I said, I work with some amazing singers and writers and I get to hear them perform all the time. So I understand what you mean, but I think you should be performing more. Yeah. You know, it's it's not funny. I'm actually healing. I, I have some overusage injuries. I've been slaving away on the instruments and I actually really hurt my hands. And so I'm on, I'm on a bit of a playing hiatus. So it's kind of a bummer. Let me tell you. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Cause even, even today was, was one of those mornings where I'm like, well, let me grab one of these things and see if I can play them. And it's like, ah, it's a little tender still. So I'm going to wait, but I do receive it. It's, 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 that live performance is a fire that really never extinguishes. It flickers, it burns, and I miss it. I really do. Okay, I'm curious. So you, you sit down with your husband, you have a singer, you're writing a song. Is that the normal scenario? Are you and your husband co-writing duo and then uh, you have artists with you? What, what's a normal scenario, if there is one? Well, actually, my husband and I, we've written a handful of songs together, but we don't write together often. Um, we both... I mean, he tends to be working a lot. He's in a totally different field. He's a yeah. scientist and he, he does have a degree in music as well. So we do write sometimes, but uh, it's very unusual for us to write a song together. So paint the picture of the normal scenario. For, for, uh, for me, the way I write? Yes, exactly. Okay, so I, I collaborate with a lot of different people and I write almost every day. Um, there was a time maybe six months ago where I was writing two sessions every day. Yeah. Um, but now it's about one or two every day. Um, but I bring in basically if we're in the same room, my, my favorite way to do it is to start with some music. So or a concept first and then some music or the music and then the concept. I like to be inspired by the music and write something based on how I feel about the music. Um, but most commonly we would write with, we write with a goal in mind. So we either have a brief we're writing for or an artist project we're writing for. So we talk about in general what we want the main concept to be and then we'll start the music and, um, and lyric from there. I don't, I don't write f lyrics first anymore. And when I first started out, that's all I did. I started with lyrics because that's, that's what I did. I was a lyricist. Yeah. But now I much, much prefer to have the music and, um, to have that inspiration first. How do you know when you're done with a, with a song? Um, I mean, it's not, it's not as simple as, well, I've filled up the bars, I have a page of lyrics. How do you know when you've, you've, you've wordsmithed it to death? How do you know it's right? <laughs> Um, it's funny. Uh, I have to think about that. It's different with each co-writer. Sometimes there, there are some co-writers that I work with that we know uh, that we are going to push each other until we get a really good song. And when we walk away, we know we've done the best that we can. And we really push to really get those great gems. And um, uh, so that's, that's ideally the way it happens. But there are other songs and there are other times, depending on the dynamics and uh, of the, the collaborators, we sometimes just come back to it. So maybe we'll go off and we'll work on it a little bit and then come back together with new ideas. And that happens too. And sometimes that works out amazing and they're great songs. My favorite thing though, I have to say is when we're in a session and, um, and I, do, I do melody and lyrics, but when I'm brought into a session, it's almost always as a lyricist, but um, I, I also do love to do melodies. But I love those moments when I feel a lyric coming on and it's this brilliant idea. <laughs> That, you know, lyrically, poetically, it feels just like it's a gem and I know this is going to make the song. And that happens, you know, it's rare, but when it happens, it's almost like it tickles coming out and I can't wait to get the words out. And then we know everybody in the room, that happens, I'm sure it happens to other writers as well, but when it happens to me, it's, I feel like this is it. This is the, this is going to make the song and this is why I'm writing. This is the reason why I write songs because these ideas, sometimes they just almost like pop out of nowhere and, um, and you know right away that it's a great line. No, yeah, it's, I, it's, it's not common knowledge. I have a 
pretty extensive songwriting background. That's why I asked the question, when you, when you write, do you find more often than not the ideas come easy or do you slave away for undetermined amounts of time? <laughs> <laughs> for, for the idea and the main concept? Yeah. Um, usually uh, when I go into a session, I already have a lot of ideas to share and then my co-writers will also have ideas or we'll have a brief. So I don't, I find the idea part to be, I want to say easy, but it's not always the case. But I find that in general, if we have a target, then the ideas can come really quickly. Um, the, but then again, there are some cases where it's really hard to come up with an idea. Like, for example, there's a, there's a really well-known writer that I work with now and then, and I, and my job is to send him lyrics when I get great lyrics. And, uh, and I find it so hard to come up with that idea because there's a lot of pressure to, you know, have the brilliant idea. So in some cases it's easy and sometimes it's hard, but I think having the, the, the target, the brief or the artist project, the direction that, you know, the artist is going in, it really makes it a lot easier for, for ideas to come out. You talked about object writing. What, what other, uh, techniques do you employ? Um, one thing I like to do is to write, if I have the time, I'll go off and write the silliest song that I can write. It give makes no example. sense. Give yeah. me an example of this. <laughs> well, okay, so one example is I was, um, I was in Hawaii um, for this uh, songwriting camp, this immersive camp that I'm a part of with the Hawaii Songwriting Festival and the state of Hawaii and Secret Road Music. Anyway, I was there, it was our first year doing it. And um, I, uh, I was there with some of my friends who were also doing it for the first time. And uh, uh, I, I was at a beach with Annie Dingwall and um, um, Justin Clunk <laughs> and Sierra West. These were my three friends who were also in this program. We went off to the Black Sand Beach just to relax and enjoy some downtime before the big push, because it was going to be four days of intensive writing nonstop, staying up all night. Yeah. And, uh, and so uh, we decided to write a silly song to kind of get our creativity going. And we wrote a song called Black Sand Beach. And, <laughs> yeah. and uh, it was very humorous and definitely not appropriate. <laughs> I was going to ask if we could share a link, but maybe not. <laughs> I was trying to think if I could as I'm saying this, but I think it's probably better not to because we really, we knew we wouldn't be censored and we could just be as silly as we wanted and that's what we did. We will just use our imagination on that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so after you write a song and you've smithed it and it's done and you know it's done, talk to me about the recording process. What, is, what does that look like? Tell me, tell me everything you're doing. So I have a studio here in my home that I use and I bring in, I have a couple of engineers that I work with. One in particular I work with most, um, Mark Dorflinger, um, who I've been working with for about nine years now. Um, but I have others too that, I, that come in to work on projects. And, um, uh, or, and sometimes, depending on the song, I might just record the vocals and guitar here in Pro Tools and then send the tracks to an engineer to, um, to work on the mix. So that's kind of how I do it here in my home studio. And, uh, and then there's some projects that I'm brought in on with other producers and then we'll go to the studio, we'll write it, um, and then he or she will produce it and, and send it back to us. So it's kind of all different ways. I have, I have a, a lot of ad projects I'm working on now that are quick turnaround projects. So for those, I have a handful of amazing producers that I reach out to in Europe and one in China and Australia and, um, and different places in the US. So if it's, you know, if it's nighttime here, it's daytime there and I can reach out to different people and they can uh, start building a track or take a rough work tape and start working on it so that we can turn the ad around, the song for the ad around really quickly. So that's kind of been my favorite way to do things right now. And, I've, and even if the ad, even if the song doesn't land in the, in the ad, I've gotten some amazing, beautiful work out of it. So I love the, uh, the excitement of having to get a project done overnight. I'm curious about, I, I like asking the question, but sometimes it's difficult to answer. Do you have any horror stories of when you were working on a project and it's just really gone south or you send off your idea, you hear the tracks come back, it's just the performance isn't there, the magic isn't, isn't not there. Do you have any, crash and burn scenarios 
Um, let me think about that. There have been some cases where the songs didn't work out. Um, uh, the songs didn't work out. Maybe there was a disagreement about the direction. And so the song just dies and nothing happens with it. Uh, and that's always a sad thing when it happens. Um, there have been a couple of collaboration. I, since I've been writing with so many different people, I've had, I've had the opportunity to really experience different writing styles. And so I've had some, in fact, I was writing an article about this kind of thing, about how some people um, I, whom I call steamrollers will come in and kind of take over the whole session and not listen to anybody's ideas. And um, sometimes people will come in the room and, and they're angry about something and they just can't let it go. So, you know, uh, but I don't know if I really have any stories of any big failures. I think they're all learning experiences. Um, well, I find that no matter what happens, whatever comes into the room, if you honor that, like if somebody comes in with a certain emotion, whether they're angry or sad, if you honor that and just kind of use that as a starting point, it can turn into something really beautiful. Um, but How do you I guess, handle, sorry, sorry to interrupt, you had mentioned those steamrollers and those scenarios. <laughs> I, think, I think every, I think all of us, probably everyone listening has been in a scenario where that, uh, I don't want to use the word ego, but that personality comes in the room, right? So how do you how do you handle that? How do you manage when the steamroller comes in? Well, if there's multiple people, and usually there's an artist in the room, I feel like the artist really has the final say about you know what's going to happen with it. Obviously, you're all going to be um, contributing your your strengths, but um, uh, if if for example another writer is not listening to what the artist wants. Um, I would try to steer it back and, and try to get um, try to get them to just listen to what the artist is trying to say because ultimately if the artist doesn't like it, you know, he or she is not going to want to release that song and or have their name on it. So um, I've had to do that. I've had to say, can we go back and listen to what what she wants to say and um, and let's make sure that this is in her voice or you know this is the way this is the way she or he would say it. And um, I've had to do that. Um, and then I guess um, sometimes it's better just to have somebody do a song map so that we can stay on track. So if it's the person, if there's one person in the room that's really aggressive about it, maybe we could ask their opinion on mapping out the concept so that they have more control over it. And then uh, that way it kind of gives them the opportunity to do something first and everybody else can kind of contribute as we go. Um, it really depends on each the dynamics of each group of writers, I think, how you have to handle it. Yeah. I'm curious to know, in regard to everything you've accomplished at this point, what are you most proud of? Is there a song or an experience or even a credit? Um, well, there are many songs I'm, I'm very proud of and very excited about. We've done so many songs since the whole... Um, uh, social isolation and quarantine period started. So there's so many new songs that I'm really excited about. But there is there is one song that I wrote uh, a couple years ago, and I wrote it when I went to visit my father in Georgia. And uh, I wrote it with my husband and my father. And my my dad, he's never written a song before, even though he's played guitar and sang his whole life. Um, and uh, so we wrote a song called Coal Dust, which is about my family history. It's actually about my, the story of my grandfather who grew up working in the mines even as a kid and he was trapped in a mine three times in his life and survived three times and so the story is basically just about the the notion that even though I don't I don't work in the mines obviously I've never had to do that the coal dust is one of the lines is the coal dust is blowing all around my family tree so it still stays with us because all of the hardship they experienced has kind of been handed down in our culture. So I, for that reason, I, I'm really proud of that song. It did win a few awards. And, um, and also it's, it's brings a lot of joy to my father. So for that reason, I do love that. that song. Yeah, de definitely send me a link to that song. I'd love to put that in the description of this. Oh, I'll send it to you for sure. Thank you. So everyone can listen to it. It sounds, sounds like a really touching song. I can't wait to hear it. Um, I was going to say regarding placements, it's kind of funny. Um, I had a recent placement in a Hallmark movie and I had so many great comments and people reaching out to me because apparently Hallmark is a really big deal. So, yeah. 
I mean, it doesn't matter what other placements happen and how much money they made, but that Hallmark movie was the thing. Everybody was really excited about it. So that was kind of fun. What was, uh, what was the song? What's that story? Um, the song is What You Waiting For. And um, it's, uh, it's just a song about kind of just get up and take control and, and enjoy your life, like seize the moment. Yeah, and that's all it is. It's just a happy, upbeat song, and uh, I wrote that with um, Cameron Steinmeis and Patricia Bahia and um, and Betty Lawrence, and Betty's the singer, and uh, that was placed by Lyric House in um, in a couple of different TV shows in addition to the movie. You know, it's so you're touching on now what 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 I do day in and day out, which is the licensing world, and I'm thinking about the individuals listening to this episode of the podcast and maybe it's songwriters who have not really even thought about the licensing world right they just want to write songs they're talented they have great demos maybe they've not connected with the right people yet but let's talk a little bit about what licensing uh, your songs and film and tv like what that means and, and and how someone maybe who was similar to you how, how do they get to that place how how do they make those connections how do you get a song in television um well this goes back to the the building your community and networking and um i say building your community because a lot of people have a negative connotation with networking but it, it really isn't that it, as you i'm sure you know no. um it's about building a community of people um and, uh, different resources and people that you can be of help to um, so it's about finding people that where you can exchange ideas and exchange different um, different uh, values that you bring, different skills that you bring. So um, um, I went to every conference. I went to ASCAP and um, Taxi and West Coast Songwriters and the Hawaii Songwriting Festival and AIMP, I mean uh, PMC and every conference I could go to to meet people. And, um, and I met many different music supervisors and um, A&R professionals and music directors and music coordinators and everybody who's doing the licensing, different licensing companies. And um, in fact, I think that's, I met you at one of those conferences, Dan. I believe so. It was at the ASCAP Expo a few years ago, right? I think it was. Yeah, I spoke, <laughs> I spoke on a panel there about licensing. Ah, And I'm okay. sure we... we met in passing or, or something, but I'm sure glad we met. Yeah, for sure. Yes. Who, who knows what amazing projects we will do in the future. <laughs> um, but without, without being negative in any way, like, is there any one particular conference out of all the ones you've attended that you find being the most valuable that you recommend? Okay, well, that's hard to answer because, but yes, I can tell you. I okay. can tell you because there are a couple of them, though. Okay. They're, all, they're all good for different reasons. Right. But I have to say that, well, my personal, how can I even say this? Because my friends lead um, and run these conferences. Yes. So um, out of respect for them, I would say that they're all amazing, but in different ways. For example, the Hawaii Songwriting Festival is my family. I always started going to that several years ago um, and I won their song competition. And next thing you know, I was just became friends with um, the Brotmans, Charles, Joni, Julia, Jody, who run the conference. And, um, and I started just becoming more and more of a volunteer and now I'm on the advisory council. And it's a small conference. It's on the Big Island of Hawaii. It used to be the Kauai Songwriting Festival, but, but it was moved to the Big Island a few years ago. And it's kept small. It's capped at 200, I believe. And um, uh, everybody's there on vacation. Uh, a lot of the panelists will bring their family. And uh, everybody's very chill and very open and approachable. So you can really get to know people one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. And, uh, and it's amazing what the Brotmans and the festival are doing for songwriters, for young songwriters, for songwriters of every age, um, beginners and um, experienced and the, bringing the Hawaii, the artists, the local artists to the festival and connecting them with people um, here or other places around the world so that they can really further their career. It's a beautiful thing and I absolutely love it. And that's the but, Hawaii Songwriting Festival. Yes. Yes, Hawaii Songwriting Festival. It's been, it's been unfortunately canceled for this year, for yeah. the first time. Uh, but it'll be back next year and I can 
definitely, if anybody has questions about that, please let me know. I can tell you all about it. But I have to also say, because you asked me, and I, I, I can't neglect the others because there's some really amazing ones out there, Durango songwriters. For anybody who's really serious about the craft of writing, the Durango Songwriters Expo is an amazing group. It's run by Jim Atterbury um, and his brother, Bill Atterbury. Um, and he brings together amazing speakers, music supervisors, um, a and people, publishers from here, from Nashville, from New York. And um, he does two conferences a year. And I've been a, um, a volunteer staff member for several years now. And there again, it's, we call us the tribe, the Durango tribe. And um, he does a conference in February in Ventura, and then one in Colorado in October. And then there's the film and TV conference that happens every May, which of course has been canceled or at least postponed. It's, uh, the new date hasn't been confirmed yet. But he brings in for the film and TV conference, he brings in um, 30 different music supervisors and 30 participants and then additional maybe 20 or so industry people that come along. Um, and people sit in a room and pitch songs for the projects they're working on. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, and you said that's Durango? Yeah, Durango. And that's it's Colorado, yeah, Durango, Colorado? It started in Durango, Colorado, but it's not based there anymore. Um, so, but it's still called the Durango Songwriters Expo. But all of the conferences take place, the, the one in Colorado takes place near Denver. Yeah. And, um, and then the other two are here in Ventura. I, and lived, I lived in Denver for three years. It's such a beautiful place to walk outside and see National Geographic in the front yard. Oh, I, I, yeah, I miss it. I miss it. I don't miss the snow, but I do miss, I definitely miss the scenery. Are there any others that you really recommend? Yes, yes, I have to say um, also the Taxi Road Rally. Um, um, that I, I'm sure you know, Taxi is owned by Michael Lasco, who's local here in Calabasas, yeah. uh, Agora Hills in Calabasas. And um, uh, it's another a way to meet collaborators from all around the world. Because if you don't know, Taxi is an online A&R service. They, they give briefs to their members um, so they can submit songs for different projects. And um, so once a year, they do a free conference for all of their members and a guest and uh, they bring in amazing panelists to speak on all anything that has to do with music licensing and um, anything about the music business so it's amazing and i've made some of my best friends in fact my very first soiree i do a lot of music events that are parties and um, my very first one happened at a taxi rally about eight years ago so i think i've been to one of your soirees um it might have been ascap expo like in the evening oh yes yes so that was a um that was a charity benefit showcase that i did in hollywood right after the expo and that was for um to benefit rock against trafficking uh, an organization that a friend of mine created and uh yeah that's right i remember that it was yeah. at the at the art gallery yeah that's right and then um, when the world is normal and it's all opened back up how frequently do you do those type of soirees um, I normally do one at, at the big music conferences. I do one at Taxi, I do one at um, um, ASCAP Expo, and then I do showcases here. Um, in, I, actually, I've done some at Bogies in Westlake. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so ideally, we had one scheduled for April 7th that was to benefit the Hawaii Songwriting Festival that just just um got canceled obviously yeah uh, and then and then we had a big one last year at the hard rock cafe in hollywood um that was to benefit the same charity and the coalition to abolish slavery and trafficking so we do one a big one at least once a year but um the smaller ones happen at every conference uh, i do uh, a um a party at the hawaii songwriting festival for the staff and, uh, and also for everybody, I do two parties there. So um, it's really just about giving people a chance to really connect with everybody they meet at the conference and have some one-on-one -on -one time to really get to know each other. It's funny because as I'm scanning over the memory of this episode of our podcast, I have jumped around so much with you on this thing. <laughs> we have talked about, I'm, I'm usually so much more structured and I'm just thinking like we have touched on so many different cool topics and i, I want to go back to like 10 different ones but you know limited <laughs> time um is, are there any other conferences that you recommend let me let me finish here before i rabbit trail again 
Yes, yes, please. Let me tell you. Okay, so the ASCAP Expo, again, I love. I've mentioned it many times already. It's, it's an amazing, and so many people come out to it. So definitely recommend that. West Coast Songwriters, which meets in San Francisco, another great one run by Ian Crombie. Really good people there, and they do a songwriting competition as well. And, um, and then the other one, I would say, oh, and I, I, I have to tell you about NSAI, because that's a big part of my life. The well, yeah, yes, please do, because that's my next big note right here. NSAI, <laughs> all capital letters. Tell me about this. <laughs> so NSAI is the Nashville Songwriters Association International. And um, so it's based in Nashville, but it really is for everybody. Um, there are over 100 chapters all around the world. And it's, uh, NSAI is it's the world's largest not-for-profit songwriting organization. It's been around since, I think, 1967. And there's more than 5,000 members, professional and um, amateur writers. And, um, and NSAI does, and Bart Harbison, who's the director, uh, does so much to protect the rights of songwriters. They're always uh, working for us in Washington. And, um, and uh, I mean, it's just an amazing advocacy organization and and they also focus on educating songwriters and um, um, celebrating songwriting so that the career can be sustainable and you know so anything that's an in interest of songwriters NSA is part of it and uh, the the chapters around the world give people the opportunity to come and play their music and get feedback and network and get to know each other and um, and then plus they have different benefits for so like the, members can send in their songs to Nashville and get feedback from professional writers and they can have mentoring sessions and they do weekly workshops and so I, I got involved when I first started writing country music and uh, but NSAI is for all genres and um, most of the members in my Malibu chapter are are not writing country they're writing pop or rock or electronic music and country too but um, yeah, so the, we, I have a chapter in Malibu that I started about four or five years ago. Um, we also have a chapter in San Diego and Los Angeles that are run by friends of mine and they're amazing. I'm, I'm gonna have you send me links to all of this that we talked about so I can put it in the description below because you are just a, a wellspring of knowledge for all things connection, right? I mean, this is crazy. You're connected. You're more connected than Legos and super glue. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, I love it. it's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> um, okay. So, so here, here okay. I'm going to change. I'm going to change directions again. I'm thinking, yeah, Katy Perry, she's going to make a lot of money. Lady Gaga is going to make a lot of money. These people are going to write killer songs. It's going to be, you know, billions of views on YouTube, radio's playing it everywhere. Yeah, but that's not everybody, right? That's the truth. Not everybody's gonna be at the top. What are some other ways that songwriters are making money? So aside from getting a hit song and, and, and yeah. doing a sync, I think. Sink right, is right, because that's the, the, the hit song. It's like, wow, like how, how tricky. Like what a select few, the lucky, right? Right, right. Or, I mean, it, it, I can't even say the luck, it's strategic at times, but the strategic, right? But not everyone is that strategic. What other ways can someone sustain a career being a songwriter? I think the best way is, you know, what we've been talking about and what you're, what you're doing is, you know, sync. Is I you're agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you me. people like Dan Brown. That is that is the answer. <laughs> Giving him all of your best songs for his licensing company because he can make things happen. <laughs> he can make it happen. Well, I mean, and so that's the funny thing, you know, like the licensing world now, I think is becoming more quote unquote mainstream or at least more on the radar because you know what, as the world gets crazier, lots of opportunities are shutting down. Like what are all the live performers doing? What, what are all the gigging musicians doing? Like people are like scrambling to set up teaching via Zoom or people are scrambling to set up. Here's the point I'm making, people are scrambling. But there's, um, you know, there is a big handful of us who, who got into the licen licensing game a while back and it's, there's not much scrambling anymore. And so I, I want to encourage uh, composers and songwriters and anyone who, who's thought about licensing and maybe, I don't want to say blew it off, but uh, it's it's not just 
viable, but it can be actually quite lucrative if you get into the game and really learn the game. I mean, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but you've had some really big placements. I'm looking at your credits. I mean, there's a lot of networks, a lot of TV shows here. Um, I won't go into it, but I'm sure that was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been great. I mean, I mean, I'm only just getting started, though. I mean, I see your credits, and I'm just blown away by the number of shows and TV uh, networks that have used your music. And, and I think that's amazing. And I have friends who've had hundreds and hundreds and probably thousands of placements. And for me, um, it's, still, it's really still in the early stages. I've had some really great placements in the last couple of years and um, a couple of commercials, which, you know, has been a lot more lucrative. And um, but so I think that's that's the logical thing to do, because it doesn't seem like film and TV is going away. I mean, we're going to just be there's so much more content being created every day. And you're right. those shows need music. And so I think it's really the best way to go, even if you're doing the other side of it and writing for artist projects or your own project or pitching songs for artists. I mean, if you write with sync in mind, um, if you think sync, <laughs> yeah. you can have, uh, you can, you know, repurpose the song or have multiple avenues, revenue streams with the song. Yeah, I think you're, you're touching on like my favorite topic of all time, which is doing things. Well, let me say it like this. You don't want to just be paid to work. You want to be paid for your works. That whole make money while you sleep thing, right? Yeah. I, gr I grew up incredibly poor. I mean, like, wow. Yeah. Very middle America, no money, like very, very, very broke. Um, I, I absolutely know from firsthand experience what it's like to be in want and to be in need. And I don't want to be there ever again. I don't ever want to be there. And one of the ways that I think as artists, we can prevent that is we start thinking more like uh, business people. The creativity doesn't st uh, stop outside of the songwriting or outside of the digital audio workstation if anything that's where the creativity really kicks into gear because you can play guitar but you can't play business you know what i mean mm -hmm. and the music licensing business is such a wonderful community um you hit the head uh the nail on the head when you said uh there's all kinds of content being created i mean we're kind of in the golden era of content right now streaming services video games movies YouTube channels. I mean, it's just like, you know, there's plenty of work. That's why I, I'll say it like this. You know, I've, I'm not trying to personalize this too much, but uh, I've always been incredibly open and honest about anything that I've ever learned because I want to be competitive with myself, not with the people around me. Mm. You know what I mean? Like if, you, if, if someone around me wants to be competitive with me, uh, I'm going to win. <laughs> <laughs> just, oh, that's great. <laughs> I'm, I'm teasing, but I'm like incredibly competitive as a dude. But, but like, you know, I'm just being funny. You know, look, jump into this licensing thing because the water's fine and there's plenty of room in the pool. That is the truth. You know? So, okay, I'm just rabbit trying because we're having a good time. But I am curious. So, what, what is, what is next for you? Like, what, what, what are you, what, what are you working on? What's the big goal? Like, what is like, what does that look like? What, what's your next goal? Well, um, there, it's kind of funny to, to try to answer that now because everything's in flux right now. But right. right for me, I mean, I really see myself doing a lot more um, writing for, for um, film and TV and ads, especially ads. I really enjoy doing that. Um, you mean I, jingles, not to interrupt, you mean jingles? No, no, full songs that can be used for ads. That's so much cooler. I'll be, yeah. I'm just being real. I'm not a jingle. Yeah. I'm not jingles. <laughs> I mean, I've written a couple of 30 second um, spots that, that are just short, but if we love it, then we'll go ahead and make it a full song anyway. Oh, yeah. So that happens, that happens sometimes, but I see myself doing as much more of that. I also find a lot of satisfaction in when I can help somebody else get a placement, which oh. I know you must know very well. I love that. <laughs> it feels so good and I'm only doing this on a very small scale so I'm sure for what you're doing it must feel so good to just be able to make something good happen for somebody else like that yeah it's the coolest thing ever yeah so I'm, I'm hoping to do some more of that eventually and get more involved in that part of the business in some way um, with with Artist Max um, we are you know we have the studio here but Ken my partner Ken and his his um, 
team of investors have just purchased the record plant in Sausalito, Very Sausalito, cool. where he's where he recorded Fleetwood Mac and so many other famous people have performed have recorded in that studio and they are renovating it and reopening it and we're thinking about having part of artist max there um, still a lot to be worked out and i'm not involved in that part of it but um, in the future that could be that could involve me going up there for some projects and doing some of our, our weekend workshops up there um, in addition to down here so there's that part of it um, you said sausalito is that correct yeah my wife wants to move to Sausalito. Like it's oh. like it's a conversation that's had on the often. <laughs> and, oh, really? so, and so it's so funny that you guys, you guys might have a, you know, that studio up there because I may be a neighbor again. Ooh, well, if you do, you just let me know and I'll connect you with everyone. I also have another very, very amazing colleague who lives up there that I could connect you with. But I, I got to see it when I went to see the studio with Ken and so I got to see Sausalito. It's so beautiful. It's like a fairy tale. Yeah, it is. I can see why your wife would like to live yeah, there. Yeah, and if you're on the, the right side of the right hill, you see the bay, you can look way out, maybe you can catch a glimpse of the city, maybe. I don't know. It's just the coolest little hidden away, magical, way too expensive place I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. you get what you pay for, maybe. Yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> maybe. Maybe not. Um, okay, so what, what have I missed? I don't, man, we talked about all kinds of great stuff. <laughs> As I promised, you're gonna send me lots of links so we can load this all up. Please send me a link to the song Coal Dust. Oh, I will for sure. I'd love to hear that. I'd love, I'd love everyone to hear that. Um, what, am, what am I forgetting to ask you? Um, well, let's see. I don't know. We've talked about so much cool stuff. We've talked about a lot. I mean, um, yeah, it's been really great talking with you. I, I gotta tell you, I really enjoyed your, your podcast. I've been watching them, listening to them, and really some interesting guests you've had. So thank, thank you for doing that. Thank you so much. I'm, you know, the hope, we can, we can camp out here for a second. The hope and goal for this is kind of what we touched on, which is humanizing people, personalizing the experience of the music industry, showing whoever that even, you know, like, you know, you're working in the songwriting world. I'm in the criminal investigatory music for TV world. I have, uh, you know, we had Freddie Herrera from Everclear. plays bass for Everclear, right? Completely different gig. He's in the rock star world, you know? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter how good you are if you're not a good person. And that's the thing that I'm really hoping that anyone picks up from these podcast is like you can't be douchey <laughs> you can't, you, right it's not it's not gonna work and I think you know even if you are less than incredibly stellar you can still have a very great career if you're a good person um yeah. you know like that, that kind of stuff I don't know at the end of the day I just want to be helpful I want to be a helpful dude Yes, you know, that's so amazing and that you should say that. That's the advice that I always give the artists that I work with, um, the young artists that come through Artist Max and, and the others that I meet. I always say the most important thing, well, obviously you're going to build your, you're going to develop your craft and build your, your community, but uh, the, the bigger part of that is finding out ways for you to, to be of service and to help other people achieve their goals. Um, and I feel like um, I, I went to at ASCAP years ago, Alan Shamlin was there and he said, he gave this big speech and his, the main takeaway from the speech was the most important thing you can do if you want to get in the music business is be kind. Yeah. And it sounds so simple and obvious, but it's so true. And I, I always tell the artists that you have to be likable. You have to be the kind of person that people want to help and they want to see succeed. Um, no matter how talented you are, it's yeah. so important yeah. that you're a likable person and, and you're kind to people and respectful and, um, and, and loyal. And I think, you know, and grateful for everybody who helps you every step of the way of your journey, you know, because none of us got where we are without the help of somebody. And um, I think that it's really important for people to know. And, and when I see somebody like you, I, I mean, you're trying to help people. I remember once, I don't know how long ago it was, but you made a post on Facebook saying you had some time and you wanted to know what you could do to help somebody. It was something very simple. Do you remember that post? Well, 
humbly because I try to make them as often as I can. <laughs> well, I, I was just really impressed. And I thought, you know, there's a guy, you're, you're trying to see what you can do to help somebody else. And just with the same with this, for example, this podcast, while I was listening to the questions you asked, and you're structuring the podcast in ways that it helps the listener, that people can really get information and, um, and you know, things that they don't really know where to go and ask. And I think that it just kind of shows that who you are. And I admire that about you because you're always trying to help people. And I think that's the key to success in the music business is to really find ways to lift each other up and to help people and to share the knowledge you've gained and you get so much back from that. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I remember hearing some somewhere a long time ago and it's, it's, it's selfish and I'll be the first one to admit it. Like, I'll be transparent about it. It's, you know, help if you, how did, how did it go? The more people you help, the more you help yourself. And it's so selfish, right? And, but years and years and years and years ago, and I mean a long time ago, I had this thought like, okay, well, I want to help people. And maybe I, I, me, I will get something out of it. And I really did have that thought. And, and I, you know, again, I'm admitting it. That's not how I feel anymore. I just want to help people because I remember what it was like being completely clueless in this town, coming to Los Angeles, no friends, fairly broke, honestly. <laughs> Pretty, pretty, pretty broke. And I just remember like, man, I just, when I really think about it, I can go in a pretty dark place about feeling like here I am, young father, young husband, just lost. And if, if these podcasts or just anything we're doing can be a bit of a beacon of hope, I, mean, I am all for it. It's a big city, scary city, right? Yeah, I love that. Yeah. All right, director of A&R, Artist Max, coolest name ever. I don't want to butcher it, Nittany, yeah. Yes. He nailed it, Nittany. For some reason, when I see your name, I want to say Natani. That's, that's okay. People do call me that, and I like that. So. And I like that. Nittany <laughs> Paris. Uh, again, we'll put all the links in the descriptions below. Hey, thank you so much for hopping on here and just rabbit trailing all over the world with me about your life and career. Thank you, Dan. And thank you. And before I go, I have to say congratulations on your multiple Emmy nominations. I'm really excited about that. Ah, thank you very much. <laughs>